uh, bound for hypergraph regularity, and this is based on a sequence of uh, joint papers, all of them with my PhD advisor, Asaf Shapira. Should I have a click? No. Uh, so I'm going to talk about hypergraph regularity, and naturally the starting point would be the famous Semiradis graph regularity lemma, which is easily, easily one of the most powerful tools in external combinatorics, and not only it has also applications in computer science, number theoretical applications, and, and uh, quite a few more, and I will talk about some number theoretical applications shortly. Uh, here is a, a, an informal statement of Semiradis regularity lemma. Uh, I will not actually be very formal here, because I will not need it, but the intuition should be uh, clear enough. So it basically says the following, whatever graph that you have, I can partition it. There is a way to partition the vertex set into numbers, a constant number of vertices, independent of the number, of, a constant number of parts, sorry, independent of the number of vertices, so that between almost every uh, two pair of clusters, you see a bipartite graph there, which can be very complicated, but it is quasi-random, so it's epsilon quasi-random. It is, it is, in some sense, easy to analyze. It very much behaves like a random graph. So here is the drawing. I can partition this complicated graph G into uh, five clusters, clusters say, uh, so that if I look on the uh, bipartite graph between V1 and V5, then, by the way, note that since there are only five clusters here, each, and this is, uh, say, an equal partition, equatable partition, all the parts of, of the same size, n over five, so these two are huge clusters, so the bipartite graph between them is, is huge and can be uh, arbitrarily complex, uh, complicated, but since it's epsilon quasi-random up to some pa constant parameter epsilon, this means that I really only need to know what is the density between V1 and V5, say 0.3, and this allows me to, for many applications, this is enough, this is all I need to know on what happens between V1 and V5 because Otherwise, it's like a random graph of density 0.3. So uh, an, intuitive, an intuitive way to think of the regularity lemma is, is as a way to compress any graph into a tiny, a constant size graph, graph with a constant number of nodes, in fact, a weighted graph. So every edge has, a, has this number, which signifies the density of the bipartite graph there. And for whatever application that you have, if uh, only, only you need to know, I mean, if this is enough, if the compressed graph is enough for, for in some sense, for uh, your application, then the regularity lemma helps. But, okay, this was very vague. Let me just give some history. Um, so the regularity lemma, as you just seen, was proved in 78 by Semerady, but uh, already in 72 there were earlier versions. Uh, uh, this is the first version of the regularity lemma. Uh, 76, probably the most important application of the regularity lemma, the triangle removal lemma by Roger and Semerady, again using a version of the regularity lemma which is not quite what we know today as the regularity lemma. Uh, again, I will not define formally what the triangle removal lemma says, but very roughly it, it says that if your graph contains many edge disjoint triangles, then it must contain many triangles, where the first many is order of n squared, and the second man is order of n cubed. Um, again, I will talk about this more lately, later. Um, this is the first application, this is the first use of the regularity lemma, the modern version of the regularity lemma, the one I just uh, mentioned. Um, and this last paper by Erdos, Frankel, and Redel, um, I mention it for mostly anecdotal reasons, and here it is. So is the title of the paper, and it talks about the number of graphs not containing a, a subgraph of constant size, uh, which is, by the way, not bipartite. Um, but I would be really interested in the really interested in the open problem that they left there, which is basically uh, the removal lemma, not quite, but essentially equivalent to the removal lemma for hypergraphs. So we had the triangle removal lemma uh, earlier. And, and they asked, is it true that the removal lemma extends to hypergraphs? Um, and they added later that they solved this problem 
And the way they did this is that they extended the regularity lemma for, for similarity, the graph regularity lemma, to a hypergraph regularity lemma. And for me, deduced the, the, the hypergraph removal lemma. By the way, the usual way to prove uh, the, the graph removal lemma or the triangle removal lemma is deducing it from the graph regularity lemma. So they claim that they did the same thing for hypergraphs. Well, they didn't. Uh, it took 20 years to actually prove a hypergraph regularity lemma. Um, and, and I would mention that Franken and Redel, indeed, in 2002, published a version of the regularity lemma for trivial form hypergraphs. Uh, but why did it take so long? So what, what is the difficulty there? So the main difficulty is to decide on a notion of quasi-randomness or regularity to use once you talk about three uniform hypergraphs, say. For graphs, I didn't actually specify when I, in the first slide, when I told you about the regularity lemma, I didn't actually specify what epsilon quasi-random mean. But, but essentially, any reasonable notion of quasi-randomness would, would work. What is known as epsilon regularity, or having a small second eigenvalue, or having small co-degrees of pairs of vertices, any reasonable notion of, of quasi-randomness is, is equivalent to, the, to all the others. For hypergraphs, the situation is much, much more complicated. Uh, and specifically, the two requirements that we, we have for this notion of quasi-randomness for hypergraph is that, first, it would hold for whole hypergraphs. So the regularity lemma that uses this notion should hold for whole hypergraphs. So it shouldn't be too strong. Uh, on the other hand, it should have what is known as a counting lemma, which is another way to say that uh, it would allow you, if you have a, a regular partition, it would allow you to count small sub-hypergraphs. So let me just give you an intuition. Going back to the graph case, we have the triangle counting lemma, counting lemma for triangles, um, which is another way to if you have a regular partition, then you can count triangles. Um, not to be confused with the triangle removal lemma. Um, so, let me just draw this. The setting is as follows. You have a tri quadratic graph. And again, now I'm talking about graphs. Um, and suppose that all three bipartite graphs are regular, are quasi-random. Um, and I have densities uh, alpha, beta, gamma. Then the number of, uh, no, this is not a random graph. What I do know is that any, any uh, of the three bipartite graphs are quasi-random. But it turns out that this is enough to deduce that the number of triangles in this tripartite graph is, uh, uh, is correct, is like, the, like you would have in the uh, actual random graph. So that would be alpha, beta, gamma times n cubed. In random. random graph, Precisely. And this would be just a case of triangles. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 60 seconds, how would you prove this? This One way to prove this triangle counting lemma. Um, OK, so consider the set of vertices here in this vertex class whose degree into, let's call this v1, that would be v2, and that would be v3. So consider the set of vertices of v1 that whose degree to v2 into v2 is not what you would expect, is, is say, too small. What you would expect from a random graph would be alpha uh, times n. All of these are of size n, n vertices. So you would expect to find alpha uh, uh, n neighbors for each vertex here. But let's consider the, the vertices of v1, which do not have, which have a, a degree which is much smaller than this then, well, I claim that this should be less than, say, epsilon fraction of, of, uh, of v1. And why is that? Simply consider, the, simply consider the bipartite graph, where this is one vertex class, and, this is, and v2 is the second vertex class. And now the density, uh, oh, sorry, so the, this bipartite graph, v1, v2, which is 
the epsilon regular, and consider two subsets. This is one subset, and V2 itself would be another subset. Now, the density here in this, between these two subsets is much smaller than alpha, which can't happen in a regular graph. I'm being very. Right, but in a, in a, right, this is the usual definition of epsilon regularity, but in fact, they are all equivalent. So while I'm at it, the usual way you define an epsilon regular graph would be that if you take two, subgra two subsets of size epsilon n on each side, then the density between them would be p plus minus epsilon, where p is the density of the entire bipartite graph. This is this is what is known as epsilon regularity of a bipartite graph. But as I said, it's not terribly important because it's equivalent to basically any other notion of quasi-randomness. Anyway, so, uh, so it must be the case that this subset is not large. Otherwise, this you get a contradiction to the regularity of the bipartite graph V1, V2, spanned by V1, V2. And same goes for the bipartite graph V1, V3. So there's a few vertices of small degree here. Now every other vertex here has a large, is basically alpha, at least alpha and uh, neighbors here, and, uh, and beta n neighbors here. So let's take one such nice vertex. Here are its neighbors. Um, and now these two subsets are large, it has many neighbors. So the regularity of the bipartite graph between V2 and V3 ensures us that the density here would be more or less gamma, gamma plus minus epsilon. So every, almost every vertex in V1 lies on the correct number of triangles, which is uh, roughly alpha n times beta n times gamma. And this applies for all almost all of the n vertices in V1, so you get alpha, beta, gamma, and cube, up to some error. OK. The, the, the message here is that the message here is that regularity um, of uh, bipartite graphs gives you a way to count small subgraphs, fixed size subgraphs, in particular triangles here. OK. What about a hypergraph? So again, I'm only, I will mostly talk on in this lecture about uh, three uniform hypergraphs. Uh, so it turns out that the na naive definition of tree graph regularity uh, does not have, is not strong enough to have a counting lemma. So let me show you this. So the naive way to extend the definition of epsilon regularity that I just mentioned to three uniform hypergraphs would be as follows. So now this is um, epsilon regularity, naive epsilon regu regularity of three uniform graphs, three graphs. So now the setting is that we don't have a bipartite graph, we have a tripartite uh, uh, three graph. And I would extend it as follows. Whenever you take large subsets, nature of the vertex classes, then the number of hyperhedges uh, between them is what you would expect, is the density of the, of the hypergraph plus minus epsilon. This would be just the, the naive way to extend a regularity to three uniform hypergraphs. But it doesn't work in the sense that <coughs> there can be no even a counting lemma for the simplest kind of, of hypergraph, of three uniform hypergraph, which is the, which is K4, the complete three graph on four vertices. Okay, um, by which I mean we have four vertices and every triple of them is an edge. Yeah. All, all four choose three vertices. Um, so here is a way to construct um, to construct such a such a hypergraph, three uniform hypergraph. First, uh, and this is all classical. This is not a new result. Uh, this is all part of the background. So let T be a tournament, a random tournament, a random four-party tournament. 
Four vertex classes, all of the same number of nodes, n. And by random, I mean that it's too large. That if you take any two vertices from different vertex classes, then the probability that the edge would be directed this way is one half, and directed this way is again one half. And for each uh, pair of vertices, the direction is chosen uniformly random. Um, and given this random tournament t, we define our three uniform hypergraphs as follows. x, y, and z form a, a hyper edge. If and only if, in the tournament t, x, y, and z form a directed cycle or directed triangle, which means that the direction that were chosen for these edges was either these directions, so this is a directed cycle, or the reverse of it. OK, so this determines a three uniform hypergraph. So now it is easy to see that each triple of vertices forms an edge with a hyper edge with probability 1 over 4, right? There are eight options, and two of them are directed cycles. And, um, and by churn of, say, churn of inequality, you can actually show quite easily that if you take any, uh, 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 any triple of vertex classes and you take large subsets here, then the number of uh, directed uh, cycles that you see there, the number of hyperhedges that you see there, is also about one quarter, plus minus a little of one. Uh, but, so this is, this hypergraph is naively uh, epsilon regular. It, 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 ends, it, it follows the, the um, it satisfies the definition of naive uh, uh, regularity, but it is not, it does not contain even a single copy of this simple tiny hypergraph K on four vertices, the complete uh, hypergraph on four, four vertices. And you can just verify this. You can just check it. It's like 15 seconds. OK. So the bottom line of this frame is that the naive way to extend the, the definition of epsilon regularity to three uniform hypergraphs does not work in the sense that it's not strong enough to have a counting lemma. OK. So back to some history. Uh, so um, about 20 years ago, and 20 years after Franklin and Redel, there were multiple versions of the hypergraph regularity lemma proved. So Franklin and Redel, as I said, uh, proved the three graph regularity lemma. And this was extended by Redel and Skoken, and then by Nigel, Redel, and Schacht. Also, Gowers gave a quite different, more analytic version of the regularity lemma. Tau gave a more probabilistic version. And Redel and Schacht gave yet another version. All of these versions are, they can be called hypergraph regularity lemmas, but they are not equivalent. Uh, they are not known to be qualitatively or quantitatively uh, equivalent. Some, some equivalents are known between some pairs of them, but not all of them. Um, and as, as I mentioned before, for graphs, this is not an issue. For graphs, all the notions of, of all reasonable notions of regularity are equivalent up to some polynomial loss in the parameter. In the case of hypergraphs, this is not, this, this not, this is not what happens. What is common to all of these uh, regularity lemmas is their bound. When I say bound, I mean bound of the number of parts in the partition. So the bound grows like the Ackermann function. What is the Ackermann function? So the first Ackermann function is the exponent. Of, of, of something polynomial in, in epsilon, where epsilon is the main parameter of the regularity lemma. So uh, what is, in general, what is the Ackermann function, Ackermann function of n? That would be n multiplication, 2 times 2 times 2, n times, so the exponential function. The second Ackermann function is the, the, the tower function. So that's 2 raised, uh, raised to x power of 2, raised to the power of 2, n times. Um, the third Ackermann function is also known as the Walser function. And the name is very appropriate because this is a tower whose height is itself a tower, whose height is a tower, etc., and compositions, and so on. Um, OK, so I will talk about, uh, I will say that 
the tower function is the correct bound for graph regularity, and the question is what happens for three graph regularities. So let me take just a, a small detour and justify why, or, or say what it was the original motivation uh, for uh, defining hypergraph regularity. So one, one motivation was from the paper of Franklin and, and Redel and Erdos that I, from 86 that I mentioned before, but here are some number theoretical um, motivations. The original motivation was to give a combinatorial proof of what is known as Semerides uh, theorem. Not Semerides regularity lemma, but Semerides theorem uh, in number theory, which says the following, uh, that for whatever, uh, k that you, whatever fixed k that, uh, that you give me, uh, uh, if you take a large enough, dense enough subset of the first uh, capital N numbers, well, N, capital N is large enough, uh, it must contain a k term arithmetic progression. Uh, probably one of the most well known theorems in maybe the whole of mathematics. Um, and the case of three, um, three term arithmetic progressions was proved by Roth in, in 53, I think, uh, using some Fourier analysis. But you can actually uh, prove it combinatorially from the graph using the graph regularity lemma. Uh, more specifically, the way you do this, you reduce the, this number theoretical question to the graph removal lemma that I mentioned before, which, which by itself I think it's, is a bit surprising. Um, it's, uh, it's the high ones. I mean, this is uh, somewhere that you have to translate this problem to a graph theoretic problem and prove regularity yeah. just for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is quite impressive. I will not give the proof, unfortunately. Uh, and once you have this reduction, you, you just need to prove the graph removal lemma, and you could do this. Uh, and basically, the only way to do this is using the graph reg uh, regularity lemma. Um, and the case of k-term arithmetic progressions follows from the k-minus graph regularity. And again, the strategy, strategy is the same. Reduce the general case of Semerides theorem to, hyper, to the hypergraph removal lemma to the k-graph removal lemma. This was formally proved by Frenkel and Redel. They, they proved this reduction, maybe at least just for k equals 4. Uh, and then the next step would be to prove the hypergraph removal lemma, which, as far as we know, uh, requires proving the hypergraph regularity lemma. So here is a motivation uh, for proving a hypergraph regularity lemma. This would give you a combinatorial proof of Semerides theorem. Semerides original proof was extremely complicated. No, no, no. The, his original proof. I mean, yeah. But uh, if I remember correctly, the, there's at the beginning of the paper there's some map diagram that yeah. shows you how to follow the, the different sections of the proof. Sorry. Complicated. But it is. So you said the way. The, okay. No, th this so this way. Say, yeah. Yeah. Quite nicely. Um, but still, this correspondence between k. The correspondence between k and k minus the 1. The density progression and the, the uniformity. The uniformity of the is not the Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So 3 would be graphs, f k equals 4 would be 3 graphs, etc. Um, oh. And perhaps what is. There are actually several applications of. of uh, uh, the hypergraph uh, regularity lemma for various density type theorems. Maybe the most important application is what is known as the multidimensional Semerides theorem, which is one of the most general theorems I know in, in, in number theory. Um, a, a very special case of it is, is Semerides theorem, but it is vastly more general. It says that for every fixed dimension and every subset of the, of the d-dimensional lattice, uh, um, there is capital N, which is large enough, so that every large enough subset of the grid uh, contains what is known as a homothetic copy of whatever fixed configuration that you want. By homothetic copy, I mean you, you multiply 
a translation of, not just a translation, you multiply every, every element of this configuration by some number and then translate everything. Um, a very special case would be if you take D, the dimension, to be 1, and you take the configuration X to be just the numbers 0, 1, 2, until K minus 1. In this case, the homothetic copy would be you just multiply this set of first numbers, first natural numbers, by, by C, and then translate it, which is another way to define a K-term arithmetic progression. As again, this is much more general. This was proved by Furstenberger Katz and Nelson. And their proof uses ergodic theory and use the, the, in particular the axiom of choice. And so no bounds on, on n follow from, uh, from, from this proof. By the way, I should mention that another way to state this theorem is, 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 is uh, saying that if it's is taking delta as the parameter. So the question is, how dense should, should the subset be so that you would get a, a this homothetic copy, um, but in any case, no bound uh, came out. This is what it did, yeah. Um, and the only proofs that actually that, that give actual bounds rely on the hypergraph regularity. Are any of the hypergraphs that you are talking about integrated before enough for this application? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, this is, by the way, not the case for semi theorem. Right. So and, this the and this should be enough. And this should be enough. I will say that this is not the case for uh, the semi theorem, the one for arithmetic progressions. Uh, there we know better versions that not using, not going through the graph regularity lemma. Uh, here, this is not the case. This is also an interesting open question. Um, and here is a fact. Recall that the, that the bounds that we get from all of the known proofs of the hypergraph regularity are of Ackermann type. And suppose that you can improve those bounds from Ackermann k to Ackermann 10, so the 10th level of the Ackermann function. Uh, then it turns out that if you actually follow the reduction, you would get basically the same bound uh, for this multidimensional similar theorem, so, and that would be the first primitive recursive bound. Uh, for this theorem. K naught here is a constant independent of k? Is that K, exactly, yeah, okay. 10. And I would just know that obtaining such primitive recursive bounds for uh, van der Waarden's theorem and Semmerides theorem, which are, which are, both of them are special cases here of this one, there were open problems for many years. And then they were solved by Schellach and Gauss in, in very uh, impressive papers. Um, okay. So that's the end of the D2 about applications. Back to bounds uh, on regularity demo, which is the topic of uh, this lecture. Uh, so the starting point for bounds is Gower's uh, famous paper from 1997, showing that tower type bounds are unavoidable for graph regularity. And I would say that for about 20 years, between 78, between Semmerides regularity lemma and, uh, and this lower bound proof, people or actually not sure if you can improve Semmerides upper bound. Because if you could, then all the applications of the graph regularity lemma, and by then there were many applications of the regularity lemma, all of them would benefit from this. This would be probably happy to hear, but this is one of the first talks ever given in this seminar. Uh-huh. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. So uh, and I would say that uh, Terry Tau predicted that the Ackermann uh, uh, type bounds that we get from all the known proofs are, um, are actually tight, are unavoidable. And people have been trying to prove this prediction for, I would say, natural prediction for many years. And basically, 20 years after that, uh, uh, Shapiro and Asaf Shapiro and myself were able to prove it uh, for any k. So in particular, we get uh, Teams uh, tower type bound, but we can actually prove it for any k. Um, in fact, uh, we prove our lower bound. Notice that actually this is not really well defined in the sense that there are many hypergraph regularity lemmas. So to which one do we prove this lower bound? So in a sense, for all of them. 
Why is that? Be because we prove a lower bound for a version of the hypergraph regularity, which is much weaker than other notions of regularity. I think all of them reduces to this notion. And in fact, it's, it is also, our notion is also much simpler. Uh, I will say that in the, in, the, in the other notions of hypergraph regularity, you need to have some, you always have this hierarchy of parameters that control regularity of one level in the partition compared to a previous level. When I say levels, I will say this. When you have a partition of a K graph, it is, it is not only a partition of the vertices, but it's also a partition of the pairs of vertices and triples of vertices, etc. And each layer should be regular uh, with re relative to the previous layer. And how regular? Well, you need a parameter for every layer. And this all gets very, very messy in basically all of the, all of the known upper bound proofs for hypergraph uh, Uh, this is, you will see this yeah. is much simpler, but no, but, <laughs> but to be honest, and I will say this later, I will, I will it, it is not strong enough to have a counting lemma. It's not strong. It's not strong. So but it's not actually okay useful, it's, it's not actually useful, but it's, it's okay for us. Bound, yeah. Right. So it's actually a stronger lower bound. Okay. Um, and in fact, if we're talking about simpler, it has almost nothing to do with hypergraphs. It's a notion of hypergraph regularity, but barely mentions the word hypergraph. OK. So uh, back to this strategy of uh, Tim Gowers. And I'm going back there because it was the first lower bound uh, proof on uh, regularity lemmas. Uh, so what it does is reverse engineer the upper bound proof. So Semered is upper bound for the regularity lemma. The, this which it was a tower of a uh, height polynomial in one over epsilon. It comes from constructing the regular partition in a sequence of step, and each step takes a refinement which is exponentially larger than the previous partition. Uh, this is all you need to know about the Semeredis proof of the regularity lemma. And Gower's lower bound proof sort of reverse engineers this, showing that you have to, in some sense, uh, iterat iteratively refine uh, your, your uh, partition, uh, and each step basically has to increase the number of parts exponentially. So a bit more, f uh, a bit more formal way to say this is that he constructs a graph using some, uh, some arbitrary sequence of exponential refinements of the vertex sets, such that for every epsilon regular partition z, if it approximately refines the ith partition pi, then it approximately refines uh, pi plus 1. And let me not define what approximately refine mean right now. And so you iterate this, which is basically reverse engineering the upper bound proof, and, and you get your bound. More on this later. Um, so let me just say that. For the rest of the talk, I will only mention three graph regularity and our, our results for only for three graphs, uh, simply because it contains all the main ideas. It's much simpler to handle, um, and this was not known before. A lower bound for three graph regularity lemma. Um, okay. Not that I know of, and I, I think so. I also think so. Not that I know of. Um, it's a very elegant construction. No, uh, it's the least pseudo random graph. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, um, I would say this that maybe the least pseudo random graph would be maybe this, this title should probably go to the health graph. Uh, the health graph is. This is a small detail, but the half f graph is the bipartite graph where you connect the ith vertex here to all vertices i, i plus 1, i plus 2, etc. So this, that would be the half graph. This by itself is in some sense very much not epsilon regular, not quasi random. Gower's graph doesn't, is not, not only 
is it not quasi-random, it does not have a small partition into quasi-random pairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so the Wauser type upper bound in all of the proofs of the trigraph regularity lemma come from constructing a regular partition in a sequence of steps, and each, steps, each of the steps applies the graph regularity lemma. So in particular, it increases the partition size as a tower type function. So the bound that you get for the trigger of regularity lemma would be a Wauser type uh, bound. And so the analog question would be, can we show that a sequence of application of the graph regularity lemma is unavoidable when you want to prove the trigger of regularity lemma? That would be the analog of what Garros did. OK, so I'll get back, get back to this question in two minutes. Right, for, for three graph regularity, the, the levels are only the vertex, a partition of the vertex set and partitions of the pairs of vertices. Okay, so that's it for a general background on the graph regularity lemma and what is known about the hypergraph regularity lemma. Uh, and let me talk about lower bounds for hypergraph regularity lemma. So let me sum summarize. Our goal is to prove a, a Wauser type uh, lower bound for three graphs. Graph regularity lemma. All known upper bound proofs iterate the graph regularity lemma. And obviously, in particular, a lower bound would have to work against those upper bound proofs and against any other possible proof. Uh, and here's an observation which would give us a barrier uh, to proving a hypergraph regularity lemma is that there is an alternative proof of the, of the three graph regularity lemma that iterates not similar to this graph regularity lemma, but a relaxed version of it. Um, hence, hence a barrier. Any Wauser type lower bound for three graph regularity must imply a tower type lower bound for relaxed graph regularity lemma. And all known graph regu low regularity lower bounds fail to work against this notion of relaxed graph regularity. Um, just let me go back two slides. Um, since there is an alternative upper bound proof that iterates the relaxed graph regularity lemma rather than the graph regularity lemma, then the answer to this question that I pose here, can we show that the sequence application of the graph regularity lemma is unavoidable? The answer is no. It is not unavoidable. It, there is a better proof. There is a proof that, that iterates something else. OK. So, and, and this partially explains, I would say, why people failed to prove a lower bound for three graph regularity for many years. So is this an original observation? No, this is an observation, I think, due to, uh, it was never published, uh, due to, to uh, uh, Shapira and Reder. Okay. So it's like postwork kind of. Oh, sorry? It's like postwork kind of or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically. Um, OK, so let me talk a bit, a bit more about this relaxed notion of graph regularity. We call it the sparse regular approximation lemma, or, or SREL for short. Uh, so let me define this. Uh, the input to this relaxed regularity lemma is a graph of density P. And as opposed to the usual regularity lemma, now you have a freedom, the freedom to modify the graph. So to add or remove 1% of the edges. So that would be 1% of P n square edges. And your goal is to find a small, by small I mean small number of parts, epsilon regular partition where epsilon would be some, say, polynomial in P or something. Whatever would allow us to apply a, a counting lemma. A useful, uh, so it should be useful. The trivial upper bound would just be to apply semiradis, a graph regularity uh, proof, not using the freedom of modifying the edges, and then you would get a tower bound um, of height polynomial in 1 over p. Is it necessary? What is the lower bound? So, and this connects to something I said previously, all previous co constructions were not resilient to uh, this uh, modification of the edges. And here is a, a, a very hand wave intuition as to why all previous lower bounds for graph regularity were not resilient to edge modifications. 
The reason is that the construction was iterative, and the construction uh, was iterative or in layers. So for example, in Gauss proof, you would start with some simple graph uh, of density, say one quarter, and then you superimpose a graph, a sp very specific graph uh, of density one over eight, and then superimpose a graph of density one over 16, and so forth. Uh, but if you have the freedom to modify 1% of the edges, then you can basically undo the, the, the long tail of this, of this construction. So in some sense, you bet you, by making a 1% modification of the edges, you stop the construction uh, at an early, early stage where the graph still has a constant, uh, a, a regular partition of constant size, constant order. Yeah, this is uh, 1% of P. One, yeah, okay, in Gauss construction, P is constant. But uh, you can scale Gauss construction to be P, but this, this, this intuition is still. Yeah, but, but again, this is hardly a proof, just very, very rough intuition. The point is that you would have to believe me that all previous proofs and, and Asaf and myself went over uh, those proofs and tried to see if either one of them works against 1% of a, a, a fraction of edge modifications. And we were pretty much convinced that the answer is no. Um, so is a low bound result from a previous paper with Asaf. Uh, for SRAL, we gave a tower type low bound. It's, although it's a, re, it's a weak regular dilemma, the tower type bound holds, and the height of the tower is, in this case, logarithmic in 1 over p. A small, another small detour, another small remark, is that in the same paper we proved a matching upper bound. So if you think that, if you believe that SRL is a natural regularity lemma, so we call it SRL is just the usual regularity lemma with the freedom to modify some edges. Uh, then then we, we managed to prove the correct bounds. The correct bounds are t, tower of height, some constant times log 1 over p. Uh, and also from the same paper, we were, we were able to uh, apply this upper bound uh, to deduce a, a result, a celebrated result of Jacob Fox, giving an improved bound for the graph removal lemma. Uh, and that result was quite interesting because it was the first time where people proved, uh, where, where someone proved the, the uh, removal lemma not using Semerides regularity lemma. Semerides regularity lemma would give you a bound here, which is tau of height polynomial one over epsilon, and Jacob improved this, improved the height to, to logarithmic in one over epsilon. Uh, though I, I would mention that his proof was somewhat ad hoc, whereas our proof is. Uh, it's more structured in the sense that you just apply the usual, or not the usual, sorry, the, the appropriate regularity lemma, in this case SRL, and then use basically the, the usual reduction. So. Uh, basically, this proof, but with a different progress measure. I'm talking instead of L2 norm, right? So right, but it, it's not quite as, as clean as saying you, have regu you apply regularity lemma and then you clean the graph and do whatever. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that, whereas our proof is that. Um, and, and more philosophically, you could say that the correct uh, way, the correct regularity lemma, the correct notion of regularity to, that you want to use for the uh, removal lemma is SRL rather than other notions. Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe or maybe not. No, actually, I, I'll mention that it's a, it is a huge open question to decide whether there are better bounds for the, the removal lemma, the graph removal lemma. The best lower bound that we know for this very important theorem is not a tower type bound, but almost a polynomial bound. So the gap is between a polynomial and a tower function. And this embarrassing state of affairs is, is the situation for many, many years. Even for triangles. Um, okay. So, uh, back to talking about uh, lower bounds. We said that it's enough for the upper bound to iterate SRL, so why not prove SRL lower bounds and this would break the barrier, uh, just like we did. Turns out it's not enough. Uh, so we define an even, weak, an even weaker notion of regularity, uh, which is, we believe, at the correct level of strength. Weaker, but not too weak. Uh, here I will 
actually give formal definitions. It's two lines, no worries. Um, and it is very similar to the usual definition of epsilon regularity, uh, but with important differences. So we say that a bipartite graph is delta regular if for any two uh, subsets of size delta fraction, their density is at least one half of the density of the, hypergraph, of the graph, of the bipartite graph, B2 A and B. So that would be the notion of quasi-randomness for bipartite graphs. And we say that a partition, a vertex partition of a graph is delta regular if you can modify delta fraction of the edges so that, say, all pairs of uh, vertex classes uh, span a delta regular bipartite graph. Yeah, you can afford those pairs because you right. all the edges from the, the irre irregular part. Irregular pairs yeah. are, are, are uh, negligible here if delta is constant. Uh, and the important difference it might just seem that we took the, the original definition of epsilon regularity and just replaced epsilon by delta, but not quite. A, and the important difference is that you can actually prove a lower bound for delta regularity for some fixed delta. Now let's go back to the definition. If you fix delta to be a constant, if you fix delta, then what parameters do we have to prove a lower bound on? Nothing here tends to zero. No? So, so the answer would be just like in SRL, we would prove a lower bound on in terms of the density of the graph. Oops. So here's our theorem, a lower bound for delta regularity. Uh, not quite our main theorem. Our main theorem would be for three uniform hypergraphs or for hypergraphs. Uh, but we need this to overcome the, the barrier that I mentioned before. And this is like a stronger version of the SRL bound. But the bound is basically the same. A tower of, of height logarithmic in 1 over p. The statement is that for any density, there is a graph of that density such that any delta regular partition of this graph where delta is 2 to the minus 30. No, 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 no. No, no, no. The notion of epsilon regularity is much weaker. You just don't want the lower bound. This is also not the main thing. The multiplicativity is the main issue. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. So given that, and I will not actually uh, go over the proof, but given that we prove this uh, much stronger lower bound because the notion of regularity now is much weaker, uh, our next goal would be to lift this lower bound. Hopefully now we can get past the barrier that I mentioned. Lift this lower bound. Into a, low, into a lower bound for three graph delta regularity, whatever three graph delta regularity means. I just defined graph delta regularity. Now, I will not define del three graph delta regularity right now, maybe in 20 minutes from now. Uh, but for whatever notion it is, we have a theorem, which is our main result, that, every, that for every density, there's a three graph of that density with every delta not regular partition is of order wowzer of whatever height. Um, the first wowzer lower bound for hypergraph regularity. So again, this is not for any of the previous notions of hypergraph regularity. It's for a, 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 another notion. But as, as a simple corollary, since other notions, the notion of Franklin and Redel and the notions of Gauss for three graph regularity, can be shown to be a, a stronger than our notion of regularity, we immediately get a wowzer type lower bound for those as well. Uh, and in fact, the call it I that I previously said that those regularity lemmas have, uh, have several parameters. So it turns out that even if you take an essentially trivial setting of those parameters, our lower bound, it is still stronger than, than delta regularity for constant delta. Uh, just because we didn't write down the proof. But it should be true. Um, Okay, so let me take a detour now. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so a quick detour. How strong is, and this relates back to the question that you asked, Avi, uh, how strong is, is delta regularity? In, does it have a counting lemma? Is it strong enough to count small sub-hypergraphs? Now, delta regularity is the multiplicative uh, right. after modifying epsilon, uh, a small portion of the edges, right? Right. But no, but 
actually there are two notions. There's de delta regularity for a bad patterned graph, and there's delta regularity of a partition. Now forget about the partition. I'm just talking about the quasi-randomness notion. The delta regularity, uh, let me go back. For hypergraphs, I didn't. Okay. But, but what I'm going to say is just about graphs. Uh, here is, I'm talking about this, the, the first time. Delta regularity for a bi single bipartite graph, not for a partition. So basically, the multiplicativity is the issue. Um, OK. So yeah, I will only talk about graphs. It is not, delta regularity is not strong enough. Even in the setting of graphs, it's not strong enough to count even triangles. Uh, and here is a relatively simple lemma. You can find arbitrary large tripartite graphs uh, where every pair of classes is, the bipartite graph there is delta regular, but there is not a single triangle there. They call that a counting lemma would say that we have the correct number of triangles if, if the bipartite graphs are epsilon regular. But if they are delta regular, then there can be no, there, it might be the case that there is not a single triangle. So no counting lemma. Uh, here is a reminder of the definition. But again, we only need the, the definition of delta regularity for bipartite graphs. And let me quickly sketch the proof. If you take just a random balanced tripartite graph of the correct density, uh, in this case, uh, delta to the power of 5, and you take the number of vertices in each class to be, you choose it correctly, then you can actually show but by standard uh, probabilistic arguments that uh, all three bipartite graphs are delta regular, and the number of triangles is much smaller than the number of edges. And now you just remove uh, an edge from each triangle, and you can show that delta regularity is preserved, and then you take a blow up of this graph, because the number of vertices in this graph was constant. It depended on only on delta. But if you blow up each vertex into any number of vertices, and replace each edge by a complete graph, that would be, uh, that is what is known as a blow up, then you can actually show that uh, using a nice argument that, again, that regularity is preserved. And now you get a triangle free uh, graph, uh, which is delta regular. All three bipartite graphs are delta regular, and the number of vertices is arbitrarily large because I took the uh, blow up. OK, so the bottom line is. Delta regularity, even for graphs, is a very, very weak notion, no counting lemma, and yet we prove uh, uh, the correct lower bound for it. Interesting. OK. So uh, I have 20 more minutes. OK. OK, so, and this is fine because uh, I will now try to sketch the, the, uh, the, the proof of the main result, but the proof itself is, is relatively heavy. Uh, and so uh, at most I can do is, is, is some end waving. So I don't expect anyone to be able to follow. Uh, but I would just hopefully give you some, some general idea. Um, OK, so again, back to a more explicit version of what is Gower's uh, strategy in his, in his 97 paper, proving the tower type law bound for graph regularity. He fixes a sequence of uh, refinements. Uh, each partition there is a refinement of the previous partitions. All of them are uh, equatable, all parts are of the same size. And the number of parts in each partition is exponential uh, in terms of the number of parts of the previous partition. And the main theorem in, uh, or the key lemma in, in Gower's 97 result says that there is a, a construction of a graph such that every epsilon regular partition, and I've said this before, but this is a more explicit version. Every epsilon regular partition Z of this graph that Gauss constructed, if it approximately refines PI, and let me just say what approximately refines with parameter X means, it basically means that if you uh, remove X fraction of the vertices, then what you get is an actual refinement. This is one way to think about it. So if z approximately refines pi, then it approximately refines pi plus 1, where the approximation parameter is multiplied by, in this case, 4. And if you iterate this, what you get is a tower type bound, because the, the orders of the partitions go exponentially, but the height of the tower is logarithmic in y over epsilon. So this was not the main result in, in Gauss's paper. It, this was like a, 
the first, I don't know, six pages of his, uh, third pages of his paper, where he gave a tower type bound, but not of the correct height. And to get the correct height, which is polynomial in one over epsilon, he had to give a much, much, or he thought he had to give a much, much uh, a complicated uh, proof. Um, and this implication here was improved uh, uh, recently by uh, Safran and myself to get, to make, sh to, to make Gauss uh, a simple proof, a simple construction work uh, and give a, a lower bound, which is a tower of the correct height, polynomial one over epsilon. So the implication in, uh, in my in Asaf's uh, paper says that if z approximately refines pi with parameter x, then it approximately refines pi plus one with parameter x plus uh, epsilon, or eight epsilon. And hence you get the, the, the polynomial height. Okay, but again, this is a small detour. Um, now let's talk about our analog of, of this key lemma of a uh, team. So henceforth, we don't have the partitions pi. We have, we have a, a bipartite setting. All our graphs will be bipartite. Uh, let the, the two vertex class, we call them L and R for left and right. And we have a sequence of refinements of L and a sequence of refinements of R. So if I would draw this. We have L, the left side and the right side, and we have a partition that would be Li, calligraphic L, and a partition Ri. And Li plus one is a refinement of Li, so it partitions every part, it further partitions every part that, that would give us Li plus one and the same goes for I, uh, Ri plus one. But the main thing here is that we don't have a constraint on the size uh, of Li related to, in terms of Li plus one, or Li plus one in terms of Li. The only restriction is we have is that on the same level for a given I, Li is exponential in Ri. But Li plus one can be arbitrarily larger than Li. This will turn out to be very important. And there's a special case of our key lemma, our cons core construction, as we call it. So what we show is that there is a bipartite graph whose den density is 2 to the minus s. s is the number of partitions, such that every delta regular partition for some fixed delta, where, the, where we have a partition on the left and on the right, so let's call them calligraphic L and calligraphic R, we have this implication this one-sided implication. If the partition that we are given on the right side, uh, on the right vertex class, is an approximate refinement of Ri, where approximate now only always means with approximation parameter two to the minus nine, then it approximately refines this partition on the left, Li, which is exponentially larger. But that's it. You can't actually iterate this, right? In Gower's uh, key lemma, you let me go back to Gauss. Key lemma. Uh, there, the situation was, so let's, let's say look at this. Uh, uh, if you refine P1, then you refine approximately refine P2, and then you apply this again. You approximately refine P2, then you approximately refine P3, and so on. This is not the case here. If you approximately refine uh, R1, then you approximately refine L1, and that's it. It stops here. So the main differences compared to uh, Gower's uh, version. First, very importantly, the partitions order can go arbitrarily fast, as I said before. And also, S, you can choose the number of partitions to be any number that you want. The trade-off is that the graph gets uh, sparser and sparser. Um, sorry about that. Um, and the property, this uh, implication that we have is one-sided, as I mentioned. If something happens on the right, then something happens on the left, and that's it. So how do we use this construction to prove our graph lower bound for delta regularity, graph delta regularity, which we claim we can, because this is a one-sided version, you can iterate it. So how, how can you symmetrize the graph? So what you do is you take four copies of this graph, of this co-construction graph, and put them along a four cycle oriented correctly. 
So you fix partitions of size. Uh, uh, now that in this, here is one instance of the, this, uh, this bipartite graph that we construct. This is the R, and this is left, um, right and left. And we fix partitions there. L i and calligraphic L i, calligraphic R i are partitions uh, of uh, are refinements actually, sequence of refinements of orders to one, to tower of one, tower of two, etc. And and now this is the orientation in the sense that this is the right side and this is the left side. And now I put another copy where what was left before would be right and, and this would be left. And then another copy here and then another copy there. Why does that make sense? It makes sense because now if you have a, a partition that uh, refines or approximately refines R1, then we know by the implication that it approximately refines L1, which is exponentially larger. But now you take a look on this bipartite graph. It approximately refines L1, or whatever you call it, then it approx or in this case, that would be R2. Uh, then you approximately refine L2, which is, again, exponentially larger. But you put the same graph between these. Uh, the same graph, but I, but I uh, have a shift in, the, in what I call Li and, and, and in one copy and what I call Li in one copy, in another copy. OK, but the point is, you will find this partition, you will find an exponentially larger partition here and an exponentially larger partition here. So you, you, you gain this, you accumulate those exponentials. Yeah, I'm just talking about the blue edges. The blue edges are the same in, uh, in yeah, 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 yeah. The, the blue is just here, and the blue is just here, and the blue is just here. Oh, this, this, this is the same graph, just four copies of it. Uh, and since this is a cycle, you get a cycle of implications, which doesn't end until you reach uh, the end, or the, 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 until you go through the, until you approximately refine the very last partitions, uh, the est partition. Uh, Yeah, it's always two to the minus nine. All along the, the circle of implications. So you probably could have, uh, I don't know, if you could have uh, looked at the graph and not at the bipartite graph combining it, but it doesn't matter. You're saying that maybe it would be it somewhat simple. Matter. Okay. Um, By four copies and not three copies? I want to get one bipartite. a bipartite graph as small as possible, which would be a <laughs> cycle that would be a four cycle. Um, okay. And here is the general version of, the, of our cone construction. In fact, we can guarantee more than what I just uh, wrote. Before, I, 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 the guarantee was a single graph of density 2 to the minus s with that implication, with that property. Actually, we can, we, the, the, our construction can give you not just one graph, but a partition of the complete graph between the left side and the right side. Partition of the complete graph into graphs, each of which is of density 2 to the minus whatever, 2 to the minus s, say. And each of them has this property, the property that we have before. And in fact, not just that, not just a partition of the complete graphs into hard graphs, but also a sequence of refinements of such, of such graphs. This is uh, maybe a lot to take in. But uh, the point is that there is now sort of a symmetry, because recall that the, the input to this co-construction was a sequence of partitions, Li and Ri, a sequence of vertex partitions. And the output is a sequence of uh, edge partitions. And this gives you a hint that we can apply this again, where now the input would be the graphs in order to construct a three-uniform hypergraph. OK. So in order to prove, uh, oh, so the, let me uh, just ask this question. Why is the core construction one-sided? Actually, I answer this, but let me just go over this again. In order to prove a wazer type lower bound, we'll apply, we will apply the core construction with, with, with partitions whose order goes as a, tau, as a wazer type functions. So wazer 1, wazer 2, wazer 3. Th those would be the orders of Li and Ri whenever, when I apply the core construction to prove our uh, wazer lower bound. But if it was the case that a co-construction held with, without the one-sided assumption, then basically the, the proof that I gave before for graph regularity uh, would work. So in a sense, we would get a lower bound which is better than a tower, which can't be. Because Semered is the upper bound also already gives you a tower upper bound. 
Uh, so in other, one, in other words, if one wishes to have a construction that holds with arbitrarily fast going orders, which we need for our hypergraph lower bounds, one has to introduce one-sidedness. Okay. So here is the, the plan for, for three graphs, and I will end here, or maybe in the next slide. Uh, perhaps the most uh, surprising aspect of our proof is that in order to construct the three graph, we use the co-construction twice, I said this. So in the second application, uh, the left side would be the complete, the set of vertexes on the left side, would every vertex would actually represent an edge. So it would be, this would correspond to a, a, com a complete bipartite graph between v some v1 and v2. And on the right will be some vertex set v3. Uh, and the partitions, ca the calligraphic Li, will be partitions of the complete bipartite graph themselves given by another application of the core construction, as, as we said well, before. Well, v, v3 will be uh, the order of the number of vertices in the original it, the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a very unbalanced thing. No? Yeah, very that's true. Um, hence the importance of having a bipartite construction where the, where the left and the right can behave, have different uh, inputs, uh, can have different sizes, different number of nodes, different number of orders of the partitions, completely independent, almost completely independent. Um, in the second application, it would, in a sense, multiply the partitions Li and Ri uh, to get a tree graph, which is hard for delta regularity. Here is a drawing. So the first application, you feed in a sequence of partitions of the vertex set V, vertex class V1 and V2 and forget about this for a second. The output of the co-construction would be a partition of the complete bipartite graph here between V1 and V2, and in fact, a sequence of such equal partitions. You take each such partition and you view it as a, a, a vertex partition of the vertex set V1 cross V2. And on the right, you put V3, very unbalanced, as Avi said. And now you apply the co-construction again, and you get another bipartite graph. But now each edge in this bipartite graph corresponds to a triple of vertices, right? One from V3 and one pair of vertices from V1 cross V2. So, in, so what it gives you, each edge in this bipartite graph corresponds to a, a hyper edge of the three uniform hypergraph that we would construct. Um, okay, so I won't have the time to actually, this is the point where I wanted to uh, give you the formal definition of delta regularity for three graphs, which I claimed is much nicer and simpler uh, than, than, than other versions. Uh, okay, I won't have the time, but maybe... Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so I'll just say this and finish. Um, first of all, of course, there has to be a notion of a partition. So for graphs, for graph regularity, the partition was a partition of the vertex set. For three graphs, the partition is a partition of the vertex set, as well as a partition of the complete bipartite graphs between any two vertex clusters. Okay, so first two partitions. Say this is the tripartite graph. Uh, so we have a partition. Here is a partition uh, uh, into vertex clusters. And also, if you take a look at on the complete bipartite graph between V1 and VJ, VI and VJ, so the complete bipartite graph there is also partitioned into graphs. So this is just partition. And the question is, is this partition an epsilon regular partition for the three uniform hypergraph that we're talking about? So first of all, as opposed to graph regularity, for three graph regularity, the partition itself has to satisfy a property regardless of the hypergraph. The property being that all those graphs G, G, L, I, J should be, in our case, delta regular. So this should be graphs that you can work with. Okay. This is one half of the of the of the, defini the definition. The other half is this, and and for this I will need to define an auxiliary graph. So suppose you have a three-partite tree graph on three vertex classes v1, v2, v3. I can define the auxiliary bipartite graph G sub H to be a bipartite graph whose vertex classes are v1 and the product v2, v3, and simply for every hyper edge with vertices v1, v2, v3, I put an edge like that. 
whose vertices are v1 and the pair v2, v3. This should be very familiar from the strategy that I gave for, for the lower bound. But in any case, you can view any hypergraph as a graph in this sense. Okay, so let, let me just call this the auxiliary graph. Uh, here is the definition of delta regularity for three graphs. Uh, so the partition has to be delta good, and I assume that it refines uh, the three vertex classes of the hypergraph. The vertex partition refines uh, v1, v2, v3. Then we call it this partition delta regular of the hypergraph age if, well, three requirements. The first would be this, that the auxiliary graph where I put v1 on one side and v2, v3 on the other side, well, if I take the restriction of the partition, or, or if I take the partition of v1 and the edge partition of v2 cross v3, then it's a delta regular partition in the sense of graphs. Okay? Uh, okay, I don't have time to explain the drawing, but the point is that we are reducing, this is the definition for three graphs, but it actually reduces, the, defini the definition is reduced to a definition of regula delta regularity of bipartite graphs, just the auxiliary graphs. Uh, relate, uh, right, no, but the right, but there they actually need to talk about these levels. They actually need to talk about hypergraphs all along. Whereas we, even for ten uniform hypergraphs, we always our proofs always deal with these auxiliary graphs. In, in this, uh, and it always reduces to the definition of data regularity for graphs, even though we're talking about ten uniform hypergraphs. So in this sense, it is it is simpler, uh, and of course. And the actual definition is two more requirements, the, the, the symmetric versions. So now the, the, when you construct the auxiliary graph, you can put aside either v1, v2, or v3. So you have these three orientations. But I want all of them, all of them to be delta regular relative to, to the partition that you are given, and I want the original partition to be delta good, and that's it. And th this is a, a definition for a three regularity, delta regularity for three uniform hypergraphs, but the obvious extension to k uniform hypergraphs is the actual definition. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I won't have too time to talk about the actual construction of the hypergraph, but I basically outlined it for you before. I uh, fix partitions of appropriate size. In this case, appropriate size would be wowzer of stuff. Um, I apply core construction once to get a, a sequence of edge equi equipartitions, each of which is hard for delta graph delta regularity, and then apply core construction uh, the second time, now in the auxiliary setting, now in, in where I view one part as, as a product and the other part as a vertex set. Um, and then the, the property that you get for this construction, somewhat analog to what you get in the, in the um, core construction, now the implication is this, is if the partition that you are given approximately refines the, the ith partition, vertex partition of V3, and approximately if end, approximately find the ith parti uh, partition uh, of V2, then it approximately finds the ith partition of uh, uh, V1, or the i plus 1 partition. And as, as in the graph case, to you need to symmetrize this to get an actual lower bound. So now it takes six copies of this construct, of this construction of a hypergraph, and you put them along a six cycle, a cycle with six edges, um, a tight cycle. Okay, so that's it. Let me just mention two uh, open questions. Um, so now we know that, uh, going back to the, this SRAL, uh, this relaxed version of the, of the graph regularity lemma that I mentioned, where you are allowed to modify edges, well, you can think of a, a natural way to extend it to K uniform hypergraph, so a K graph SRL. So now we know that it, it, it has a lower bound. We actually, just even for the, also for this definition, we have an Ackermann lower bound. Um, can you prove a matching upper bound? Can you actually first formally define what is K graph SRL and then prove a, a lower bound, which, an upper bound, which, is, which matches uh, our lower bound? Um, and if you do prove this, uh, if you do prove an upper bound for the K graph, for the hypergraph SRL, then you can uh, perhaps uh, 
I would say likely deduce a k-graph removal lemma, and then you get an improvement for the best known bounds for the hypergraph removal lemma, very analogs, analogous to, to Jacob's uh, improvement of the removal lemma for graphs. I assume this, this should be possible. Yeah. So minus the O, right? Uh, yeah, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK. Um, and one final question. Um, given that we've shown that even delta regularity, which is a very weak notion that David didn't even have a counting lemma, uh, given that even this weak notion has Ackermann lower bounds, it makes sense to come up with a weaker notion than hypergraph regularity with primitive recursive uh, uh, bounds, and which is still actually useful, which you can still use to count small slap hypergraphs. Delta regularity that we defined w is not useful, and it has bad bounds. So can you get some, some other definitions of some other notions of regularity for hypergraphs, which avoids all of these Ackermann bounds? I would assume that maybe yes. <laughs> 